Hi. Hey. <laughs> Welcome back. Good evening. <clears throat> nice to be back with everybody tonight <clears throat> um, or this week. I guess many of you aren't watching it probably in the morning. But anyway, here we are uh, continuing our journey through First Samuel. This week, we're going to be covering chapters 13 through 16. And really kind of the theme of this uh, section is Saul goes quickly off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess that's probably the best way I can summarize it. Does anybody else have any kind of summary impressions to to begin with? He did have a good case, though. He had a good excuse. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, kind of, sort of. If but you're we'll impatient. If you're what? Impatient. Oh. All right. Well, let's dig into chapter 13. I need to just shift things a little bit here so I can get my Bible in front of me. All right. Chapter 13. Um, we've got uh, this is um, we kind of start off with an interesting little kind of biographical information that Saul was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Uh, so it just kind of gives us a time frame here that we're looking at. Uh, and he's kind of building an army. So he chooses men from um, several areas. And we also meet his son, Jonathan. Jonathan will figure in prominently later uh, in the story. Jonathan becomes a key figure. Well, and he really already kind of is. Um, and then the setting here is that they are um, in the hill country of Bethel. And um, I've got two different uh, kind of um, translations of where they're at. One of my Bibles says the name of the place is Gilgal. And the other Bible says it's in Gibeah. Uh, so either way, um, or um, yeah, either way, they're in an area near Jericho, which is close to the Dead Sea just to kind of give you a frame of reference here. And Saul um, has assembled the army and he's waiting. Um, he and Jonathan are wanting to attach or attack the Philistines. And he's waiting to um, for, for Samuel to come and do a sacrifice. And you know, kind of ask for God's blessing on their battle. And Saul gets impatient because Samuel doesn't show up when Saul wants him to. Hmm. Um, and the men are starting to scatter. So like Carl said, in one sense, we can see that Saul kind of makes a good case for himself on it because what happens is then Saul takes it upon himself to do the sacrifice. Um, but as I was reading my, my Hebrew Bible and the commentary that went along is that really Samuel comes later in the day uh, mm -hmm. than, than what Saul wants. Um, and so Saul does the offering and Samuel arrives and Saul goes out to meet him and Samuel is mad. Um, what have you done? Uh, and Saul kind of says, you know, when I, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling, I thought, well, now the Philistines will come down against me. And I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I com felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. 
So we see here, you know, that Saul is, is making a good case for justifying what he's done. On the flip side of that, though, we see that Saul is not faithful. Uh, he's not trusting God, that God's going to take care of them, um, which has kind of been a problem all throughout their history here for the Israelites. Um, these and for leaders, us. Yeah, well, and for us, too. We, we <laughs> God doesn't act in the time that we want him to, and so <laughs> we take it upon ourselves. Olivia. Um, if he, I, I just had an observation about this part is one, he's not wrong, but two, if he was faithful, everybody would be able to see and wouldn't scatter and would trust in his leadership and God's timing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me get this straight. Are you making an argument that then it was okay for Saul to do the sacrifice or? No, I'm saying that it's not a surprise, like that he's unfaithful. Oh. If he actually was and he trusted in God's timing for when Samuel would get there. Yeah. It you can tell in a leader and you trust the leader and you wait. That's what you see. Like, um um uh, I forget his name, what the walls. Jericho. Um, Joshua. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they knew that he trusted in God and that God provided through his actions and through his personality as a leader. And Saul did not. So they it makes sense why they started to scatter. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And um, so because he's done this now, Samuel then has a uh, prophecy um, uh, and he says, like, if we look at verses 13 to 14, you acted foolishly, Samuel said, you have not kept the command the Lord, your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So Saul now has the word um, that yeah. his time is short. Um, and so um, Samuel leaves. And Saul and his son, Jonathan, and their men um, are staying at Gibeah and the Philistines are camped kind of on the hill across from them. And so they have raiding parties that go out from the Philistine camp. And we're told that they're sent in three detachments or three columns um, to kind of come against and come and flank uh, the Israelites on either side. But the Israelites don't have weapons um, because the Philistines have taken away all the blacksmiths so that they don't have uh, any weapons. And so um, none of them have a sword or a spear, only in Saul and Jonathan have them. So that's kind of the situation now that they're facing in chapter 13. Uh, the Philistines are on the march um, and they have no way to defend themselves. So then Isn't it interesting, sorry. <clears throat> no, go ahead. When we look at the events of this past few days, what's going on in Israel? Mm -hmm. And then we hear... You've not kept the command the Lord, the, your God gave you. If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Now, how many? I don't know. Yeah, I can't help. How many times was it missed along the along right. the way, way back? Yeah. 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 And I've been thinking about that a lot, too, as I've been kind of reading and studying, especially because at church, we're still, we're like <laughs> in the Testament as well. We're in Genesis. 
Um, so it, it's just, you know, when we look at this early history and how easy it is for us as human beings to just kind of slip off the path. Yes. You know? Yeah. And, and I think Jesus was right when he talks about the road being narrow. Um, because it it is it's it's very easy to just all you've got to do is just put one foot off off the path and pretty soon you're you're veering off course uh, yeah it, as narrow as a balance beam yeah because yeah, once you step to the right or the left oh okay oh, yeah you good fall. analogy yeah all right so now as we move into <clears throat> Um, chapter 14, we see Jonathan's um, kind of bravery and um, stupidity. No. What? Stupidity. Well, I don't know that I'd call it stupidity. He's got oh. some real, um, I'm trying to think of a word here. I, the yeah. only word I can think of is street smarts. And I know that's not it, but he's, he's, he's smart about this. Uh, and so he, um, he decides that he's going to go like as a spy, he's going to spy out um, uh, and on kind of a sneak attack. Yeah. He's being sneaky. You're right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And he only has his um, armor bearer with him. So yep. it's just him and his armor bearer. And he does this without anybody's permission or knowledge. He just takes this upon himself to go. But the thing that overwhelmed me as I was reading this chapter is um, how Jonathan is contrasted with Saul here, where Saul gets impatient and wants to act on his own and not depend on the Lord's timing. Jonathan really kind of flips the script here and really does depend on the Lord, that the Lord is going to help him and guide him through all of this. Uh, and so they, they go, uh, and Jonathan even says, um, and I'm looking at verse six in chapter 14. Yep. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Um, so I think that really kind of speaks to Jonathan's character here as well. Mm -hmm. And his full and complete trust that God is going to take care of this. And if it is something that he's meant to do, God will bless it. And if it's something that he's not meant to do, that God will hinder him in some, in some way, but he really does uh, trust in God. Uh, and so. Um, he So does his partner. Yeah. And so he kind of sets this um, like a kind of two options. If, if we, um, if we go over and let them see us, if they say, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. And, and that's exactly uh, what happens. Um, the Philistines fall before Jonathan and his armor bearer. Um, and they, they defeat them. Uh, 20 men in an area of about half an acre. And then panic strikes the whole army, uh, those in the camp and those in the field. And it was a panic sent by God, is what they say. And so Saul is, is trying to figure out like who's left because he doesn't know who left the camp. Um, and, and they find out that it's Jonathan and his armor bearer that aren't there. And um, so Saul calls for the Ark of God uh, to be brought. And um, says that they, um, 
is this part where they do the um urum umum and the thermum? No. Oh, it just says, so the Lord rescued Israel that day and the battle moved on beyond Beth Avon. <clears throat> so eventually Saul joins when he sees that they're having victory. I'm sorry, I'm losing my place in my notes. Um, And so they're successful. But then Saul makes a real critical error here, a mistake in his um general his his marshalling the forces in that he has um the men fasting doesn't want them to eat any food and um but Jonathan doesn't know that Saul has imposed a fast and so Jonathan eats some honey and um and then one of the soldiers tells Jonathan, well, we're not supposed to eat anything. And Jonathan's like, well, I mean, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but Jonathan's kind of like, well, that's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> we well, just wrestled all these guys. We're a yeah. little bit on the uh, hungry side now. Um, so you want me to see that part. Huh? Verse 29 verse 29 sure. Jonathan said my father has made trouble for the country see how my eyes brightened when I tasted a little bit with a little bit of this honey how much better it would have been if the men had eaten today some of the plunder they took from their enemies would not the slaughter of the Philistines have been even greater yeah, so they're all exhausted and they all um, plunder everything, right? And they're and they they're starving. So they start slaughtering the animals, the butchering the animals on the ground, and they ate them with the blood, which is a violation of um the command, uh, the dietary laws that the Israelites are supposed to follow. They're not supposed to eat meat that still has the blood in it. They're supposed to drain the blood out of the meat, which we still do to this day. That's why meat is, is hung for a, a period of time so that all the blood will drain out of it, right? Correct. Um, so... So they they violate that um, because they're <clears throat> so hungry. And so Saul tries to um, kind of correct that. And he builds an altar. It's the first altar that Saul builds. And then they're allowed to eat that meat. So he tries to um, correct it. So then the priest says, um, uh, or uh, Saul, Saul wants to inquire of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them entry into Israel's hand? I'm looking at verse 37 here, but yep. God did not answer him that day. So Saul inquires, but God is silent and doesn't give him uh, an answer. And so Saul wants to find out who committed a sin uh, and who ate, who violated um, my orders not to eat. But none of the men are going to say anything. So then he uses um, the, is it the Urim and Thummim or, or is it just that they cast lots? Oh. Casting of lots. Is what I yeah, have. the casting of lots. Um, and finally, the lot falls on Jonathan. And Saul says to Jonathan, What did you do? And so Jonathan says, I just ate a little bit of honey. Um, and now I have to die. Kari. 
What is casting the lot? I don't know what that is. Well, it's a it's a way. Yeah, it's a. I mean, they would use um, like stones or sticks or whatever they had, and it was a way of asking for divine guidance in like who to choose. So, for example, in in the book of Acts, after um, after Pentecost, after the event at Pentecost, then the disciples need to replace Judas, and so they cast lots. And the lot falls on Matthias. So is it I, like a vote? Kind of, or maybe like they're throwing stones or something. They set up like everybody, you know, it has their own slot and whoever gets the most stones in their slot when they throw the stones, that's. Oh, the I one. see. Yeah. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It was pick like, up sticks. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Or like Yahtzee. It's the only game I can relate it to. <laughs> like rolling a me. large straight or a Yahtzee. <laughs> what did yeah, you yeah, say? Yeah. It's, it's like, like what? Up sticks. Oh. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. All right. So anyway, what is supposed to happen is that Jonathan is supposed to die because he violated Saul's command but all of the men of the army rally around Jonathan and and they're like no um we're we're not going to let you kill him because he brought about this great deliverance it was him that right. led it um and so um we I don't get it if they cast a lot and the, all the stones rolled over Jonathan's way and now they're saying no why did they throw their stone or They're, stick or whatever Jonathan's way? Well, they don't throw the stones. One person throws the stones and supposedly divine oh, guidance one. makes the stones go into Jonathan's slot. Okay. Yes, Olivia, enlighten us. <laughs> I I saw this as his dad is making like a big show of things by doing this even though it's kind of like it's it's kind of unfair because he hasn't followed god's rules himself and so now he's like yeah you must die it's like well that's not really fair if you you should die then yourself but i just found it to be like an arrogant like puff of his chest kind of way of like oh well well to do this <laughs> I'm the boss. Yeah, yeah, basically. I got that same impression that this is a matter of pride for Saul. And I also think Saul is a little bit jealous of Jonathan, that Jonathan mm. is the one who kind of led the defeat of the Philistines. And Saul is not happy about that because he's not the center of attention. And he can hear the God. Yeah, exactly. And 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 Jonathan does. Jonathan you know, listens to God and, and, and does what God is, is setting out for him to do. That's, that's what caused the whole battle and defeat of the Philistines. To mm -hmm. begin with. Yeah. He led it. And then God took over. <laughs> right. Right. Cause God confuses all of the men, puts them all in a panic. Um, so Saul stops pursuing the Philistines and they go back to their own land is what we're told then in verse 46. And then we're just kind of given this little footnote here that after Saul assumed role, rule over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side, Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah and the Philistines, wherever he interned, he turned. He inflicted punishment on them. He fought valiantly and defeated the Amalekites, delivering Israel from the hands of those who had plundered them. And then we end with a description of Saul's family. And the two names that are important to note in Saul's family here are, of course, Jonathan and Michal, um, Saul's daughter, Michal. Um, just kind of keep Keep those in your mind. No, no, no. It looks like it's it looks like it's Funny. pronounced Michael, 
No. M C H A L, but it's no. McCall. That is his youngest daughter. Yeah, that's what I said. Her name. Oh, I thought you said older. No, pay attention to her name and to Jonathan's name. Those are the two okay. that will figure in in the story as we move forward here, especially as we move toward David. Okay, and David's story. All right, any other thoughts on chapter 14? <laughs> nope. Okay, chapter 15 is interesting, and this is kind of another nail in Saul's coffin here. Um, where Samuel delivers a message, um, to Saul from God. And, um, he says that they are to go and destroy the Amalekites, um, destroy everything, um, everything that belongs to them. Don't spare them, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So the order here, the directive from God is clear. Completely wipe them all out. So Saul gets the men together and um, then they go to war against the Amalekites but <laughs> once again, Saul doesn't do what God says. He spares Agag, uh, who is idiot. the leader of the Amalekites. I don't know if he's their king or what. And they save the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. And then the Bible says Agag is the king of the Amalekites. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I also have to just chuckle at this. My verse for four in chapter 15. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them. Yeah. <laughs> mine mustered them together. Yeah, mustered. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mine mustard. doesn't say that. <laughs> no ketchup, just mustard. <laughs> We're all mustered together. What does yours say, <laughs> Olivia? Mine just says he mobilized them. Ah, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so boring. Well, Mine, mustard is kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So the word of the Lord comes to Samuel. Then I'm looking in verse ten here, um, and God says, "I am grieved that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions." Uh, and so early in the morning, Samuel gets up and goes to meet Saul. Um, but he's told that Saul is not there. He went to Carmel and set up a monument in his own honor. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, wow. Yeah. And so Samuel finally tracks him down. And uh, Saul is like, oh, hey, bless you. I carried out what God said I was to do. And um, Samuel's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> I can hear sheep bleeding. Um, you know what? I can hear cattle. And Saul says, oh, well, they just brought back the best so that we could do a sacrifice. And it's interesting. My Bible says in verse 15, um, I, I thought it was interesting the way this is worded. Saul answered, the soldiers brought them, brought them. Um, the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. He's passing a buck on the soldiers. Not only that, but he doesn't say to, sac to sacrifice them to the Lord, our God. He says to the oh, Lord, you are God. Mm, that's good. I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, I, didn't I just don't think he's either. a good leader. I think he has. Um, I think the potential was there initially, yep. but he just he's just not a good leader. It's gone to his head. He's gotten um, drunk with power is kind of how we would say this. Full yeah. of him, I, I, I don't I don't 
look at it that way. I I think of it as if I were, I I think of myself as a follower, even though I've been told I have potential to be a leader. It'd be like putting me in charge of something, and at first I'd be like, "All right, this is okay. I think I got this." And then it's just <laughs> kind of like, "No, like I don't got this," and just not. Like, throughout this description, it says he does stuff, but I, I almost, like, read in between the lines with this, with this story for him, that I think other people do things for him. I don't think he actually does anything, because they know he doesn't know how. Like, who's going to tell him to, like, to do certain battle strategies or whatever? He's going to have people there to advise him, and I just don't. That's Thank a really you. interesting take on it, Olivia. And I think that makes sense if we look back at the reason that the people chose Saul in the first place was because he was good looking and tall. Yeah, but God, God anointed him. So it's like if others see potential in you that you don't see in yourself. But... Yeah, but I think, I think God anoints him because he's going to give the Israelites what they want. They want a king. Um, God doesn't want them to have a king. God right, is the king. Right. Oh, right. He gives them what yeah. they want. And so what they want is the tall, good-looking king. God knows how all this is going to turn out. Um, yeah. So And so now he's just like, I'm king. I can do whatever I want. Exactly, like, and then he he becomes arrogant, but he doesn't. I think people are doing stuff for him or telling him what to do. Cause he has no idea. Probably, and I think you're right though that he is more easily led. Um, so maybe maybe he had all the good intentions of wiping out the Amalekites and everything, but then somebody's like, "Why are we wasting all of these animals? These right. are really good sheep and cattle." And Saul's so like, yeah. "Hey, you're right, you know." And why are, why are, do we kill the leader? We got the leader. He's a major prisoner of war. Um, and so I was like, well, yeah, that's a good point. You know? So, yeah. But I, I think it's interesting when, when Samuel confronts Saul that um, he, that he didn't follow God's command. Saul argues with him. Like if you look at verse 20, he says, but I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites, Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. Um, and Samuel is like, no, you didn't. You and and what you did was you you went against what God said, and now you're trying to justify what you said because you say oh we can use it as a sacrifice but that's not what the ward wants the lord doesn't want sacrifices he wants obedience Idiots. and yeah. who did not obey and i i took a lot of my stuff like verse from verse 17 which kind of um because it, it says although you may think little of yourself which I, which is what Samuel says to Saul. So yeah. Saul clearly does. That's that's where I get my interpretation from. I, I wouldn't think very good of myself if I were, again, told to lead something. I I just wouldn't. I wouldn't have the self confidence. And so then, when I think he's, people get defensive when they're embarrassed or they know they did something wrong. So he's right. just embarrassed. Yeah, and he's and he's caught, and so he's trying to justify why he did something wrong. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, then I think let's read verses twenty four through thirty five because I think that's really kind of an interesting end to. Um. Samuel's interaction with Saul. Samuel is going to be done with Saul now. And essentially God is done with Saul too, because Samuel is his prophet. So Olivia, can you read 24 to 35, please? Yeah. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I have sinned. I have disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command. 
for I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. But now please forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel replied, I will not go back with you since you have rejected the Lord's command. He has rejected you as king of Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul tried to hold him back and tore the hem of his robe. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to someone else, one who is better than you. And he who is the glory of Israel will not lie, nor will he change his mind, for he is not human that he should change his mind. Then Saul pleaded again, I know I have sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel finally agreed and went back with him, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring King Agag to me. Agag arrived full of hope, for he thought, Surely the worst is over, and I have been spared. But Samuel said, As your sword has killed the sons of many mothers, now your mother will be childless. And Samuel cut Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel went home to Ramah, and Saul returned to his house at Gibeah of Saul. Samuel never went to meet with Saul again, but he mourned constantly for him, and the Lord was sorry he had ever made Saul king of Israel. Yeah, so yeah. kind of a sad um, turn of events here now. Um, it it hasn't taken very long for Saul to, as I said at the beginning here, to go off the rails. Uh, and and really what we're seeing here is, like I said, God, God knew what was going to happen with this. God didn't choose Saul. God agreed to anoint Saul because he wanted the people to see that their choice wasn't the right one. And I think the people are starting to kind of get a glimpse of this. Um, and so now God is going to choose the king, which is what leads us now into chapter 16. And chapter 16 is probably most familiar to a lot of us where David is chosen uh, and anointed as king. And Samuel goes to um, Bethlehem and to Jesse a man there and because the Lord has, has said, this is who I want you to go to. Um, and so the Lord tells Samuel, it's one of his sons that I want you to anoint. And so Jesse has, um, um, how many sons does anybody? Seven. Yeah. Seven. So all the sons are brought before Samuel and they're not the one. And finally, finally, Samuel is like, is this it? Do you not have any more sons? And, and, and Jesse's like, well, there's the youngest one, David, but he's just a shepherd. He's out in the field with sheep. And Samuel says, well, go get him. Um, we're not going to sit down and eat until he gets here. And when David comes, then God says, rise and anoint him. He is the one. And so Samuel anoints David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And then Samuel then went to Ramah, which is his hometown. I so, don't get what happens next after this. Like it, the, my, my wording anyway, for the events that occur after this. Yeah, so let's talk Saul. a little bit about that. What happens after this? Um, it, and um, Olivia, if you want to read your translation, um, just go 14 through 17. Does that kind of help to, us to answer your question? Yeah. Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. 
Some of Saul's servants said to him, A tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music, and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. So the key here to what has happened is that the spirit of the Lord departs from Saul. And then... Yeah, but the tormenting spirit, wouldn't that just be the Lord filling him with these emotions to let him know, I have it's left evil. you, like the... It's not evil, though. It says it's the Lord says... Book. Well, yeah, I mean, some translations will say an evil spirit. Um, yeah. Olivia's says a tormenting spirit. It's probably yeah. closer to say it's a tormenting spirit. Um, what we've got here is, like Olivia said, Saul, the spirit of the Lord has left Saul. And so now Saul mm -hmm. is flooded with all of these emotions, regret, um, sadness, depression, anger, anxiety, all of those things. So that is the like tormenting spirit or, or the evil spirit. I mean, a, this is how the evil one kind of works against us by heightening all these negative influences or thoughts in our minds. And so that's what's happening to Saul. Yeah. He's being tormented by all of this stuff. Um, that's that's where I got confused because it says the Lord sent the spirit. So I think of it as inherently good. So yes. The evil one says sends evil spirits. Unless you're saying the Lord let Satan no. No, inflict right in his spirits say, upon because... him. Yeah, you're right in what you say. If we say the Lord sent this, we know that God is good and God can only do good. God cannot do evil. Yeah. So what God does here is allow Saul to feel, this is a consequence of Saul's decisions not to obey God. It, yeah, the punishment. Yeah. And so what Saul is experiencing here is the consequences of his failure to trust in and obey the Lord. And so the Lord's spirit that has been guiding him up until this point has departed now because now the Lord's spirit has gone to David. Um, and now Saul is being allowed to experience all of those emotions and feelings uh, and everything that come as a result of his poor decision-making that feels evil. Um, and it, and it is evil. It's, it's disruptive. It's, it's yeah. sad. It's nasty, but, but the evil doesn't come from God. What comes from God is the consequence. Well, my book, says you know that the the spirit departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him so God allowed an evil spirit to go and torment him so it's yeah. it's from God yeah yeah that's that's what I, I was um initially confused by because it um when I read the Lord sent a tormenting spirit i think of that spirit as like an, an angel of the lord technically but, to, but god is just punishing him saying i'm going to allow this evil spirit to torment you with all of these emotions and you will never feel my presence again so one thing that we have to be careful of when we translate when we're depending on a translation from the word from a word in Hebrew is that there are many meanings in Hebrew that can be, that that can mean. We can attach many different definitions or translations of that word evil. And yeah. in my Bible here has a footnote, but I also noted it from my Hebrew Bible. That word evil is actually in my Hebrew Bible and even in my footnote, 
is translated as injurious. Okay. So it's uh, a, a spirit that injures him, that torments okay. him. Mine says uh, psychological aberrations. Yeah, which is exactly kind of what we've been of talking about. Yeah. Of the mind. Yeah. yeah. Mine says mine says a demon, but I don't think that's accurate. I think it's more so uh, uh, Kari, it's what a... you're talking about, Mom. Kari. Um, well God has control over the spirit world. Good right. and evil. Yep. Yeah. Doesn't matter. So God didn't necessarily sense them. But yeah, I agree with everything you're saying. It was allowed. Yes. Yeah. It's allowed. Kind of I like think. In the book of Job. Yeah. When Satan comes into the throne room, because yeah. that's Satan's job is to act as the accuser. Uh, and, oh, yeah. And he, oh. you know, asks God, you know, consider your servant Job. You know, he's only faithful to you because he's got all the stuff and a good family and everything. And God allows Satan to torment Job within certain boundaries. Right. Satan yeah. must adhere to those boundaries. So, yeah. Um, I just have a thought on that. Just really quick that came to me. Yeah. Um, we, al we always ask the question, why do good things happen to bad people? people or why do why do bad things happen to good people sorry mm -hmm. i put that around well vice versa it could be the same yeah um not that this is an answer but it makes more sense in my brain that if god has control over everything he will allow certain things to happen to good people within certain boundaries not because of a consequence but because of i i think of a bad event must happen to you to alter the structure of your brain sometimes to propel you forward mm -hmm. onto the the pathway that God knows that you're going to get to, but it cannot happen without the allowance of that bad event. Right. Right. So it strengthens that's your where, faith. Yeah. yeah. I think some people get so like they just think of God as good, but I, I think it's like this is oh, a yes. good example to read that he allows certain bad things to happen because he has control over everything. Because right. he, yeah, well, like you said, he even allowed Satan to torment Job. Right. Well, oh, yeah, because I was going to say, yeah, the book of Job, that's, that's living proof that, you know, God allows some things right. to get our attention. Well, he just, allowed, I was going to say, he allowed Satan to tempt Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. Yep. Yep. So just this last weekend, this past Sunday in church, we, um, we covered the story of the testing of Abraham, the binding of Isaac. Uh, yep. uh, and yeah. what I compared it to in my sermon was, and I, I kind of opened with, okay, you know, every now and then on the radio or on the TV, you get this message, um, you know, but the, the signal, this is a test. This is only a test. This is the test of the emergency broadcast system. Da, da, da. This is only a test. In the account in yeah, Genesis, yeah. binding of Isaac, we are told at the very beginning, then God tested Abraham. But see, Abraham didn't get the announcement that it was a test. So God <laughs> tells Abraham, to take his only son, whom he loves, Isaac, and offer him as a sacrifice. And the test there is, Abraham, do you trust me enough to do this? And, yeah, and we'll you see, you see that Abraham, that 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 really is kind of playing out in the story here, because even when when they're ready to go up to the mountain. And they leave the servants behind. It's just Abraham and Isaac in the wood and the fire. And Abraham tells his servants, he says, wait here. The boy and I will go over there and worship. And then we will come back to you. 
we will return to you. So even at that moment, before everything, Abraham has faith that somehow God is going to make this all work out. And if that means raising his son from the dead, that's that's what it is. But Abraham is obedient. You can't, yeah, you can't be, if you know that a test is coming, that it defeats the purpose of the test from God. It's like if you know something good is coming, you get excited. Yeah. It, it's it's the same thing when something bad is coming. You're never gonna. Right. You shouldn't know, because then you can't poke holes where they need to be poked. It doesn't work. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so then the rest of this, then what we see is even though God's allowing um, Saul to suffer in this way, God also provides soothing relief okay yeah Yeah, or relief he provides that david now will come and david um is the one um who soothes saul with his singing and playing his his harp or his lyre um and so then saul gets relief and he feels better um so so there's a, a a ray of sunshine and hope and care that comes out of this too. God doesn't just abandon Saul in the pits of misery. He provides a way for Saul to be soothed and taken care of. I have a good footnote. Yeah. From for it talks about for verses 19 21. It mentions that sometimes our plans, even the ones we think God has approved have to be put on hold indefinitely like david we can use this waiting time profitably we can choose to learn and grow in our present circumstances whatever they may be wow which is so interesting because a quote i heard from walt whitman or someone said it was from walt whitman i may be wrong it says be curious not judgmental if you're curious, you can learn more. If you're judgmental, you learn nothing. Right. Yeah, but curiosity killed the cat. Mm, I I think there's a certain boundary to that, yes. though. Yeah, yeah, there is. I like the quote a lot. Um, because That makes a lot more sense. Because when we yep. take time to get to know someone or something about a situation that you know, our curiosity then takes the judgment out of the equation. When we well, seek to understand and to learn, then yeah. um, it takes it takes our inclination to to look down our noses and judge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We don't know their story. Harry, we haven't let you get in much of a word. I That's am a good so discussion good. tonight. <laughs> oh, no, it's been it's been good. Yeah, this has been a good That's conversation. Good. Yeah. All right. Very so nice that's it. All right. We'll continue now Yay. with uh, David and Saul next week. And I want to kind of move um like the split through David and Saul here, just kind of hit some of the highlights. So um yeah. Yeah, I'll let you know because it, it gets quite lengthy. Yeah, because everybody knows the story. Well, some of it, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Highlights. Yep. All right, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for your love and for your forgiveness and or your forgiveness. And we thank you for sending at last a way to rescue us and bring us back to you through the person of your son, uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Lord, we ask that you help us uh, to be less judgmental, to be more curious, to care for others. And Lord, particularly this week with the events that are happening in uh, Israel, in the land that you have chosen for your people, we ask, Lord, that you protect all people who are living in that land, reunite families, console those who mourn and bring peace to that land and the war and the killing. 
We know this is not in your will. We pray that you would be with us as we go our separate ways this week. Give us the power and the opportunities to continue to bear your love into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we will see you again next week. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye.